Good afternoon. I'm delighted to present an update on HIV cure here at the Interest Conference. This is Timothy Brown, also known as the Bourbon patient, who unfortunately passed away last year. But he still stands for the hope that curing HIV is possible. And much research is going on to reach a cure, and I hope to give an impression of where the clinical HIV cure field stands here. And since this field is broad, I will try to highlight the main advancements in its field. And this will probably also elucidate where we are now and might also shed a light on what the future holds. It is a good idea to first answer the question whether we still need a cure. Because especially in non HIV specialists, healthcare professionals can ask that, and I think many of you are familiar with that. They rightfully say, however, that entry to health therapy has dramatically increased life expectancies of people with HIV compared to those without, as is also evident from this study from the United States of America. Many other studies from different settings all show that once entry to health therapy is introduced, life expectancies indeed near normalize. But is that sufficient? Well, in my opinion, finding a cure remains essential. Because while life expectancies has increased, from the same study, we can also appreciate that people with HIV live twice the time with comorbidities than someone without HIV. And this number is strikingly unaffected by the introduction of antiretroviral therapy. Second, with viral persistence and the need for lifelong therapy, mutations and emergence of important viral resistance with HIV variants of concern can arise. And this is something we've seen happening before with the increasing use of NNRTIs, for example, in these cities studied in this uh, study. And the fear, I think, rightfully exists that this might also happen with the newer drug classes we have. A third important aspect is that the average cost of a first line integrase inhibitor based antiretroviral regimen is higher than the average annual income on Earth. And this signals the huge financial challenge for worldwide, worldwide antiretroviral therapy coverage. And last, the importance of stigma can't be ignored, and not having to take a daily pill can certainly help with that. So huge excitement emerged when the burden patient was cured after undergoing myeloablative induction therapy followed by consolidation through a double allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant from an HLA-matched CCR5 Delta 32 deleted donor for his relapsing acute myeloid leukemia. And this has been successfully repeated in a few patients that, become, that became known under the city names where they have been treated, but not in others. Several key factors might be associated with viral rebound. And of course, this is the donor choice, but also the time on antiretroviral therapy, and especially the moment of antiretroviral therapy interruption seems important for success. Interruption of therapy after successful engraftment looks optimal. <laughs> Um, but however, something like a mucositis can also result, and this happens quite often, of course, in stem cell transplant patients, in insufficient drug absorption and, and exposure. And this, together with a potential latent graft, can in turn give space to viral tropism shift to escape the viral entry bottleneck of donated CD4 T cells. That was the whole idea of the transplant. So despite the importance of demonstrating the proof of cure that it is possible, stem cell transplants are no safe or scalable option due to substantial mortality and morbidity for the far majority of people with HIV. A significant effort is being done by the international research community to find a cure for HIV, and only in the clinical trial field alone, already uh, almost 200 studies are registered to study different strategies to cure HIV. What I will do here is try to highlight the current status of the main strategies by focusing on several key clinical studies. So gene-based therapies uh, to eliminate CCR5 receptors can be promising based on the stem cell transplant results. And actually several gene editing techniques exist. And with a gene editing te technique called zinc finger nucleases, researchers were able to disrupt CCR5 and autologous CD4 T cells. And the stable number of gene-edited CD4 T cells was maintained in patients after reinfusion. Despite their persistence and decay in HIV DNA during treatment interruption, all patients rebounded upon analytical treatment interruption, however. 
And probably follow-up studies in this field should try to increase the yield of CCR5 disrupted cells or include conditioning schemes. Along the same line, in 2019, a report on another gene editing technique, CRISPR-Cas9, that showed that it could offer potential benefit in HIV patients. A case report, on, a case report underlined its potential, where since a patient here uh, with HIV and an acute lymphoblastic leukemia received a CRISPR-Cas edited CCR5 ablated hematopoietic stem cell transplant after cyclophosphamide conditioning and total body irradiation. So here, full donor chimerism with a long-standing persistence of the edited donor lymphocyte was achieved at approximately 5% prevalence. But the viral rebound occurred swift, despite the upregulation of the proportion of disrupted cells. So what can we learn of this? Um, I think that stem cell transplants and gene editing therapy hold promise, but need further refinement. So how about other strategies? Alternatives evolve around either interventions that decrease the size of the viral reservoir or to enhance HIV immunity. Using latency reversion agents or LRA to short reservoir cells makes them express antigen and potentially amenable to immune effector functions. And it becomes increasingly clear that probably a combinatorial approach of both known as shock and kill or kick and kill, was probably warranted. So how about using antiretroviral therapy alone? Well, this can induce a viral emission after antiretroviral therapy interruption in subset individuals for sure. And this is most likely to occur in patients who initiated their therapy during acute HIV infection, probably due to a smaller reservoir. And this has been shown in the Visconti cohort, as shown here on the left graph, and also in the CHAMP, meta-analysis of 14 treatment interruption studies. However, as you can see, that this does not happen in all acute HIV patients that interrupt therapy, and the precise host factor associated with control remains unclear because there are no exceptional anti-VUH immune responses to be appreciated or protective alleles in this, po in this population. Uh, that, uh, and then I mean the population that gains control, of course. Um, also, with a, with a small reservoir being an important factor, some patients who initiate antiviral therapy during chronic phases of the infection might also be able to achieve control. And the low free red cohort, which is shown on the right, suggests that this might be true for a relevant proportion of patients. Because here, as you can see in the red box, an estimated 10% at a low reservoir and 1% at no HIV DNA detectable at all. As we probably all know, total HIV DNA is a sensitive but not a precise marker of the replication competent reservoir. So the question is still out which patient would benefit most or benefit at all from treatment interruption. So this is a non exhaustive and subjective list of the main LRA that have been used in kick and kill trials. And a common conclusion of these, uh, uh, of these compounds in clinic is that they to, can to some extent successfully reactivate uh, HIV from latency as here with Romidepsin. However, the amount of reactivation has not yet led to a clear reduction in HIV reservoirs overall or replication competent compartments. And in addition, some of these compounds, including Romidepsin, can be toxic to immune cells, including anti-HIV lymphocytes required for reservoir eradication. <clears throat> Therefore, more potent kick and kill strategies are likely necessary. But combining agents can lead to success, but we don't know very well often how these com combinations would behave. The pharmacokinemics can have unpredictable interactions, interactions with toxicity, and preventing toxicity remains and should remain an important focus of our research field. So latent HIV infected cells is enriched by memory CD4 T cells that express, immu express immune checkpoint uh, molecules. And these molecules can also be blocked by immune checkpoint inhibitors targeting, for instance, PD-1 or CTLA-4. And this was an interesting substudy of the AIDS malignancy consortium where antiretroviral therapy suppressed patients with advanced malignancies were assigned to anti-PD-1 therapy with nivolumab with or without anti-CTLA-4 by ipilimumab. And as you can see, 
on the uh, latency reversal was observed in the dual treatment arm with, with, with some signals of replication competent reservoir decay in a subset of patients shown here in the graph on the right. An interesting but, uh, but also very complex field is the stimulation of cellular cytotoxicity. And this can be achieved by creating chimeric antigen receptor T cells or CAR T cells. And the interesting thing is that these CAR T cells harbor synthetic receptors with an HIV specific extracellular domain, which is fused to intercellular signaling domains. Um, the, also, what's I always if I think of it, it's, it's very interesting. But the first CAR T cell trials already started 30 years ago and showed actually that this could be done quite safely with an adequate persistence of edited cells and potentially lead to delaying viral rebound. Newer HIV specific CAR T cells that additionally uh, co stimulatory intercellular signaling domains are currently being studied. Stimulating immunity can also be achieved by creating virus-specific T cells with BNAP secreting function. And HIV-specific T cells are expanded in the presence of HIV antigens and cytokines, and then transduced with BNAP constraints for enhanced antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Or you can also make CAR T cell constructs that also express BNAP single-chain variable fragments to redirect CAR T cells against different regions of the HIV envelope. And clinical trials are underway with these CAR T cells. And a promising approach might be to use by specific CAR T cells to minimize the risk of viral escape. But also here, an important point remains toxicity and especially the cytokine release, syn uh, release syndrome that can be associated with CAR T cells. Here I show vaccination studies. In a reduced single arm phase B trial, a decrease in the viral reservoir did not lead to sustained viral emission when combining a synthetic P24 GAC peptide vaccine, GCSF, followed by late reverse baromidepsin. And these results probably partially fueled creating the phase two open label randomized clinical trial called the River, you're shown on the right, that included acute HIV infected patients. Here, no differences were observed between a combination of T-cell inducing vaccine with farinostat and the control arm during follow-up at all the endpoints. And the striking thing was that this was, this, this was despite enhanced uh, anti-HIV uh, CTL effector functions. Um, so in, in River, no anti analytical Twitter interruption was done, but in others, uh, it was, and both the BCNO2 study, which used an adjusted prolonged prime boost scheme of this vaccine that was also used in River together with Robidepsin, and also in, a in the ALIX002 randomized clinical trial where a T cell inducing vaccine was studied, they both did an analytical treatment interruption. And in these trials, uh, the, the, the viral rebound was not, not prevented, but, but interestingly, the viral load set point seemed lower in a relevant proportion, suggesting a, some form or level of inducible control. And the ALEX003 study is currently ongoing to study the vaccine and combinatorial approaches. To summarize, HIV cure, where do we stand and where do we go? I think it is clear that we have a decent inventory now of potential cure drugs that can set the stage. And the next steps for now are to come to our personalized kick and kill strategies based on host and viral characteristics. Combinatorial approaches are likely necessary, but ensuring safety is a priority. Last, collaborative studies using the existing consortia can help building well-powered studies to find relevant signals of cure in subgroups. I had the privilege to work with Charles Boucher and he often told me, don't just count the frogs you see in the pool, but understand why they are there. And in case of the reservoir frogs, the simplest way is that they are there because it is nice, quiet, and without predators. So focusing our efforts on these factors will ultimately lead to a cure. Thank you very much for your attention.